Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us at this very special Doha Goals Forum Google Plus Hangout. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by David Duke and Mikhail Silvestre to talk around um, a very special topic of how can sport be used to alleviate challenges facing children and young adults. Um, a couple of words on our speakers before we go through the participants who will be joining us. Um, David is the founder and chief executive of Street Soccer Scotland, a non-profit social enterprise that uses football to help create positive change in the lives of socially disadvantaged adults and young people. Named as the Sunday Times Changemaker of the Year in 2012, David has also been recognised by Edinburgh's Queen Margaret University, which awarded him an honorary doctorate for his work in this field. David is also the Global Ambassador for the Homeless World Cup organisation. David, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Our second guest speaker is Mikhail Silvestre, former Rennes, Inter Milan, Manchester United, Arsenal and Werder Bremen defender, capped over 40 times for his country, France. Uh, Mikhail set up in 2006 Schools for Hope and since its inception the charity has funded the construction of opening of four schools in Africa and Asia which currently help over 600 children providing them with a brighter future filled with hope and without poverty. Mikhail, welcome. Thank you. David, if we start with you first, if you could give us a little bit more background into Street so Soccer Scotland, um, how you became to set up the organisation and the sort of impact it's having locally. Yeah, well, um, Street Soccer Scotland is a social enterprise based um, in Edinburgh, but we deliver programmes all throughout Scotland in the four ma major cities in Glasgow, uh, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen. Um, our kind of mission is basically to use sport as a, a catalyst for change. Um, the, the reason we were, we were set up in uh, 2009, um, the reason we set up football played I had a massive part to play in my own development as a, as a, a young adult. I was um, I grew up in a, an area of social deprivation and through some family problems I ended up um, being on, uh, being in a homeless project, uh, back that was about ten years ago, and at the time my father passed away and I was very low, and football became the rope that I needed to pull myself out of a dark hole. Um, my experience of of using sport to change my own life was the the, the reason behind street soccer, and we now deliver a, a range of programs to over four thousand people in Scotland. Um, from drop-in sessions to we have national league programs, we have educational courses running in some of the schools and some of the, the socially deprived areas and we also have employability programs aimed at getting people off the streets and or from socially disadvantaged backgrounds back into employment using sport as an initial engagement tool but build, using the, the skills from sport to help them develop in life. Well, thank you, David, for joining us. We are absolutely delighted that you are able to be part of this very special Google Plus Hangout. And welcome to Mikhail. Mikhail, thank you again for joining us. Um, Schools for Hope, give us a little bit more information um, about how you became involved in that from your time in professional football to setting up uh, the charity. Okay, so while I was uh, playing uh, for Manchester United, we used to, um, to work at the youth been a uh, been uh, for for different uh, missions on the ground and also at Manchester, and uh, I was I was happy to participate. But then I decided that I wanted to be involved a bit more. So I went to UNESCO in Paris and uh, I met this lady who was running a program called uh, Education uh, Through Ball Games, and. Uh, We've decided to create an organization called Schools for Hope. So in 2006, we started uh, by opening a school in in Guinea, one of one of the poorest country in the world, um, not in Conakry, but um, deep in the land of, of Guinea. It took us 12 hours to uh, just to drive, and that was the first uh, opening of the school with 25 uh, street, street children, um, mainly. Um, orphans, and they used to uh, just get some food uh, while working for um, for small shops in the, in the, in the city. 
So for three years they, they've been spending, uh, yeah, during three years they've been spending time in a boarding school where they uh, they've been taught uh, reading, writing, counting, and also they um, they have uh, they've been taught taught um, a job. So they've been working in workshop, different different uh, different works. So that was the first one. Then we went to uh, Niger. Um, we did the same again uh, with the uh, 300 uh, children, and uh, after we went to um, uh, to Laos, and the last one was last year in Haiti. We opened a school for 60 children, uh, a bit grown-up children, like 60, 16 year old to uh, 20, and this time the uh, those guys they were already. Uh, Capable of reading, writing, counting, so they've learned skills to rebuild the country. So they're still in a program right now. So that's that's what I've done. Uh, the only country I haven't been is Laos. I didn't have time to to go over there. But the rest I've uh, been three times in Guinea, uh, two times in Nigeria, and last year Haiti. So uh, that's how I spend my time with School for Hope. We're raising funds, and uh, good thing we did with Haiti that. Uh, that was all the uh, Arsenal players gave one day salary, and so we, we built uh, a school uh, worth 200,000 uh, pounds. So that was, that was fantastic. Fantastic. And we are uh, genuinely honored to have both David and Mikhail with us today, two people who are very influential um, in this topic of you know, using both of their organizations to really help. Um, children and young adults who are facing these challenges through sport. Um, we're delighted that we are joined um, by people and participants from all over the world. We have um, people in Washington, in Lille, in France, in Scotland, uh, and in London. Uh, and I will go through um, and welcome everybody individually now. So we have Anise who joins us from New York. Hello, Anise. Hi. We have Arnold, who joins us from London. Hi, Arnold. Hey, how are you all doing? Good. We have Camilia, who is in France, Lille, France. Hello. We have Chloe, who joins us from Washington. Hello. And very finally, we have Kirsty, who joins us from Scotland. Hi, everyone. So thank you ever so much for, for joining us, everybody. We're going to start with Anise. I believe you uh, have a question, and um, we'll uh, hear that question, and I believe David will be first to answer. OK. Um, my question would be, what examples can you give us of how sport actually changed life in, in your own community? Uh, I think sport can, sport can change, lives, uh, change lives in a, a number of ways, depending on who you work with, we work with, with adults who are experiencing mental health problems or suffering from homelessness or addiction problems, whether it be alcohol or drug addictions, or even young people who are getting involved in, in gangs and in trouble. But how sport can change is uh, if you take the example of someone who has mental health problems, mental health could include somebody who's depressed, uh, very low self esteem. Is anxiety issues by break, by by getting them involved in sport, you're taking them into a into a, a group of people where they can communicate, they can um, be part of a team, have fun, and actually build up some skills. So, for example, our drop-in sessions we have them all over Scotland where people can come down during the day and access free football. They, by doing that, what they'll do, they'll increase their confidence because they're out, they're mixing with people, they're, they're increasing their, their fitness, which then leads to them feeling better about themselves, and so the whole self-esteem, so sport can have a real impact on mental health, um, but that's just one example. If you're looking at someone who's maybe been out of work or, or, or struggling, who has poor social skills or poor skills to try and actually get a job and stuff, by getting them involved in a regular programme, whether it be the football programme or the personal development courses that we run, it builds up some structure in their week and again gives them the confidence to go out and change their own lives whether by getting a job or, or getting into education. And Mikhail, the same question to you in terms of um, the local impact that you've seen. Well, like uh, David said, I think um, 
gives uh, like the youth uh, something to, to look for and um, just basically taking them out of trouble. I mean, okay, I'm not uh, talking about mental health because uh, I have no experience about that or people uh, being on drugs, but I mean, uh, youth who is uh, in, in trouble and causing trouble in the street, when you when you give them activities, um, something they can uh, rely on and uh, something they can look forward to uh, once a week, twice a week, or every day. Obviously, it's, um, it's natural that um, b taking part of it um, regularly, that will, uh, that will uh, put them away from, from trouble. So for me, that's, uh, that's really important that uh, even small, uh, small organization, uh, private organization, are able to, to, to look after those, those children. Thank you, Mikhail. And our second um, question, we are going to go to Arnold in London. Arnold, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to ask your question, I believe it's uh, to Mikhail and then to David. Yeah. Okay, my question is, well, basically, I'm the founder of the Wood Win Charity WAM campaign, and we recently held a forum with the Ghanaian community, and we looked at the future of sport, and the conclusion was that the main obstacle um, for advancing sport was the political and institutional corruption. Um, so I wanted to know, um, well, I would like to know if policymakers are needed to bridge the gap between the youth and sport, or should it come from private organizations such as, like my one, WAM Campaign? So, Mikhail, if that's you first. Yeah, Arnold, are you talking for Ghana or for everywhere in general? Oh, no, Ghana was just an example. All right, okay. I think um, private organizations are really important because uh, if you rely on politicals, they've got one agenda, it's the next election. Um, when I travel in Africa, I've been the first year I've traveled, I talk with some politics. Yeah, we're gonna help you, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. You come the next the next year. It's different people. Um, so that's that's one of <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, they just well for me it's different because yeah, they they want to meet me and oh we're gonna help you because you are Michael Silvestre and so and so. Um, but for you guys, I think what you're doing is really important on your own. Sometimes you can get help from the politicals and the community who are in charge, and it's really important to, to get together because uh, it will maximize uh, the benefit and, uh, and it will work better. But um, um, in general, I would say that you can rely more on private organization than, than political. And David, in terms of British politics and the balance between um, the role that British politics has to play here and, and private organisations such as yourselves, um, how do you see that? Um, I think when you look at um, for the political side or, or, or even the kind of sport governing bodies, uh, I think the government, are, their main focus for sport is to produce elite athletes. So it's more focused on at the top level and trying to to create um, a lot, uh, athletes maybe for the Olympics or future uh, sports stars. Uh, so I think there's a real gap. I mean, when you look at the sports governing bodies, you've got the, the, the focus on elite athletes and then you've got the focus on uh, young people uh, as participation, sport as a participation to get the numbers up. But I think there's a real gap and that's where private organisations such as Street Soccer Scotland or Schools for Hope or, or anyone, I think there has to be a there has to be a, a, a group of sports projects that, that are tied into the government so they because we can address the needs of the community. I think the sport for change and what kind of Doha goals is all about is using sport as a catalyst for change and, and the effect that sport can have and I, I don't think the government actually get that. So you have to have organisations that are private who actually have a real understanding of the, the needs of the community. Thank you, David. Could I, could I ask a follow-up question? 
Of course you can, Kirsty. Um, first of all, me, Karen and David, how reliant are you on government and the public sector for funding, or does your funding come mainly from the private sector? Well, funnily, you should say that I actually just had a really a, a big I had a meeting yesterday with the Minister for Communities, uh, Shona Robinson, uh, which was actually a really positive meeting uh, about the the speaking about the legacy of the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games. The from the funding side, street soccer, we are uh, we are a social enterprise. We are we're not we don't receive any government funding. We 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 gain our income from service contracts uh, through. Uh, delivery of programmes for job centre. We run employability programmes which create income, which then feeds some of the grassroots programmes that we do. We also have a uh, sponsorship, uh, sponsorship and uh, corporate events, so we work closely with PwC and uh, Barclays. So we run corporate football events, etc., which generate income, which then feed the, the grassroots programmes such as the drop ins and, and so on. Achieve the care. Schools for Hope is getting uh, funding private, 100% uh, private. But uh, I want to go back to um, to the first question from Arno. Uh, Arno, sorry. And um, I was involved in the uh, uh, One Goal uh, campaign last year, uh, two years ago. And uh, it was um, generated through uh, the government in England. Uh, and uh, <laughs> have attended some uh, meetings, and uh, 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 didn't see anything coming out of it. So, just another example of a uh, yeah, good campaign towards uh, the World Cup in South Africa. One goal is education for all, but um, we don't. There is no follow up. Um, we don't know what what happened with the funds. And uh, that's it. It's it's gone. So that's uh, that's a pity. Thank you for your for your answers, gentlemen. Um, our third question will come from Camilla, who is in Lyon, in France. Uh, so my question is: With professional football being a ruthless business, tarnished with moral scandals, is it becoming harder to use football values in your action with young people? Look, I will start with you. Right. Um, yeah, it's it's, um, it's funny you ask this question because I was uh, Friday last Friday I was in uh, in France um, giving trophies to to youngsters um, and um, the, um, the district president told me that after the World Cup in South Africa with the behavior of the French national team, twenty uh, percent uh, it was a twenty percent drop of um, of uh, of uh, players signing for uh, license, uh, so yeah, there, is, there, is, there, is, um, there is that problem at the moment that um, football as a professional is is looked up as uh, being show off, uh, being show business, and uh, so it's what it is. Corruption and well, in the end, well, the 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 main part is football itself, the game. Yeah. If you play foot, you play football because you love you love it. Then everything else comes around, and you have no choice. You are part of it. But uh, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, to for the children to look up at uh, at players and um, and say, oh, this is a, a role model. I like to, uh, to be like it. It's not not many, but still, I think there is a there is a lot out there. But uh, uh, that's not what the the press is focusing on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big problem. And to you, David. Um, I think. Well, I think that just touching on what uh, Mikel said there, that the press have a a great way of making things um, look bad to to sell newspapers, unfortunately. But th th there is there is a lot of players out there, or uh, professional sports people, who who maybe don't. Do the right things for someone who's in that position, but there's a lot of good work done by some. I mean, I'm based at a professional football club here. I I know the good work that some of the football players do, but that's not the stuff that gets printed. It's mm. the stuff that, that that sells newspapers. But I think if you take sport and professional sport uh, for for actual moral values, you'll still have the basic teamwork, passion, 
Uh, togetherness, when you see fans celebrate and, and players come together. So you, kids that are looking up to these players, they still see the moral values, which is leadership, uh, teamwork, um, and, and, and a lot more positives because, as I say, football has a big impact on, on the community. You know? Thank you for your question, Camelia. And then over to Chloe, who is joining us in Washington. Hello, Chloe. Hi, how are you? Good. We're all very well, thank you. Chloe, what's your question? So I have a question for both of you. Um, obviously, you both use football as a, a means to drive and a catalyst to drive social change. What is it about this sport in specific, in particular, uh, that seems to have such an impact on youth? David, should we start with you and then we'll come across to Mikael? Yeah. I mean, in, in Scotland, although the Scottish football team is not very good at football just now, um, <laughs> it's, it's the, and I'm going to get slated for saying that, but um, football is the most popular sport here in Scotland, and that's that's the reason behind street soccer and what we do. And I think football is good because, like other sports, if you look across the world, uh, any class, whether it be middle class, lower class, people who are poor, people who are rich, Football is for everyone. You don't have to have such as like golf, for example, is, is a sport which we need some some money to actually do because you need equipment. Football is great because all you need is some people, uh, a couple of jackets, uh, a piece of ground, and it brings people together. So football is it goes right through the classes, and it's probably the most accessible. I think I think any sports, any, any kind of team sport, is great for social development because it, it, it creates kind of a, Communication between one another. And Mikael. Yeah, I mean, um, you go, well, when I went to um, Guinea, Niger, you walk in the street and two, uh, two out of three uh, person are wearing football shirt. Uh, same thing as David, uh, football is easy. You just need uh, um, a ball and uh, it can be two pieces of wood or two rocks. And four rocks, and you have two two goals, and and then teams uh, teams get together. That's easy to to set up. Um, then you have all the values that you get into um, into football, uh, which is um, a team game. You would have the same in rugby uh, and all these uh, ball uh, ball games, uh, which is encounters, endurance, tolerance, respect. Inclusion into a group, socialization, achievement, self-esteem, amusement. Uh, you get respect from your teammate, respect for the referee. So I think all those values are are there. You don't need to um, to encourage uh, really the the players uh, to feel it, uh, but it's there around them and it gives them the right uh, the right way to. Uh, to continue in their lives and, and bring what they learn into sport into uh, into different uh, different uh, time in in their life professional or with the families with the friends uh, you get from, from the pitch uh, you bring it outside and I think it's 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 all positive. Thank you. And our very final question is from Kirsty in Scotland. Kirsty. Hi, what I wanted to know really was what lessons have you specifically learned when you were setting up your organizations and your foundations that would help other organizations set up in the future? Things perhaps that went wrong that you could give them advice to do differently or lessons that you've benefited from learning? Mikhail, we'll start with you. Uh, for me, uh, being on the ground when I went there, um, I just realized how lucky I was uh, to be involved in uh, professional football clubs because when uh, it starts with organization in, in the middle of Africa, in the middle of nowhere, and you want to get people together at the same time, to start um, an activity or start meeting people around, it's very difficult. So I was like, God, <laughs> this, is, this is difficult. But um, that was part of the challenge, and that was interesting to, uh, to see how to see that um, I wasn't that patient, really. Uh, yeah, but uh, I think um, what I've learned also is that um, on your own, you, you do little. And with uh, people around you, you do much more. So 
um, schools out it's been uh, doing well, but uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, to do our goals and to meet David and you guys to uh, exchange and and bring forces together because um, together we're going to be stronger, obviously. And David, um, I think um, just the actual echoing on what Mikael says. I think my experience, uh, and I think for for most sports program. Partnership is, is kind of key. I mean, there's um, any any new project looking to set up should also look at what's already out there, who, what people are there, whether it be in Haiti or Lagos. Look at the community and look at the skills the community have and bring everybody together. Uh, and that's what we've done in Scotland. We look at we work with sports organisations. We work with um, the mental health organisations, uh, housing providers, so everyone everyone has their own skill sets but, and if you bring them all together what you're creating is a perfect platform for your players to get the the, the most benefit. Um, so yeah, so I think just kind of team effort, uh, as, as Mikhail says, that's that's the best advice I, c I could give someone just to kind of work in partnership. Thank you both. And I think finally, the um, question from us would be that obviously you're both speaking um, at the Doha Goals Forum uh, December 10th to the 12th. And I really want to get um, to understand, David, what, do you, what, you know, what are you hoping to, to achieve from, from, that, from the forum? What's the one thing that you know that you, you ideally looking to achieve uh, out in, uh, in Doha? Well, the, the first positive is I don't have to bring my umbrella because, it, as you know, it's very, it's very rainy in Scotland. <laughs> but um, I think it, I think it's great because what I'll look to achieve is to meet people such as guys like Mikael and and other people who are involved in community sports projects from across the world and find out what it is they're doing, how do they do it, and if there's if there's things that I could maybe learn and say, well, that's something that could actually work here in Scotland, and at the same time use some of the experience maybe I've collected in setting up a social enterprise. And sharing it with other parts of the of the kind of community sports uh, projects. And Mikael, I'm just uh, looking for meeting a Carlos and get his autograph. No, I think uh, it's going to be a great opportunity to get together, sit down, and. But uh, what I like to do uh, is to make sure we uh, we put a calendar in front of us and say, right, this is the next next step, next step, and the next step step after. So that's that's my target over there. Well, thank you, Mikael. Thank you, David, very much for giving us your time today to discuss. Uh, this topic. Thank you to everybody else who contributed with a question. We hope that you found your question was fully answered, um, and that also that you take away some from learnings from from this um, from this hangout. Um, and of course, if you want to find out more information about the Doha Goals Forum, then you can go to www.dohagoals.com, uh, and the forum runs from the 10th to the 12th of December. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mikael, um, and goodbye from everybody here. Thank you, guys. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye bye. See you in Doha. See you all in Doha. See you in Doha. Bye bye.